It is that wonderful time of the winter again, where annually the heating in my apartment just breaks. It's a ceremony at this point that my landlord cares a lot more for than I do personally. I could do without it, but I feel like to that giant corporation, it has some sort of emotional value. It's very attached to it. So I'm wearing a jacket to record this because it's too cold otherwise, but honestly, I think for a werewolf video, it's pretty good. Do you like to hunt? Werewolves certainly do. They are master hunters. Individuals sworn to the secret hunt, serving the father wolf. And because the name werewolf is not cool enough, they are known as Uratha. No, not the funny thing you're thinking they're called. Though it does certainly kind of sound that way. It's Uratha. Ah, oh, wait, hang on. I'm sorry, I seem to have, uh, I seem to have like mixed up my scripts here for werewolf, uh, the whole hunt thing is actually the lore of Werewolf the Forsaken, which is Chronicles of Darkness, also known as the New World of Darkness, not Werewolf the Apocalypse, which is part of the World of Darkness, also known as the Old World of Darkness, even though it is Werewolf the Apocalypse that now got a new version in the new edition of the Old World of Darkness, which some people call the New World of Darkness, because the old new World of Darkness, which is just the new World of Darkness, is mostly defunct, except when it isn't. Are you confused yet? This is I, this is one of the questions you get about World of Darkness uh, the most, and I'm gonna try my best to sort of clear it up. It's very confusing. If you just want to jump straight to the werewolves, just skip to the next chapter in the video. So basically, intuitively, the World of Darkness is the old World of Darkness, and the older of the two worlds. The original vampire, werewolf, and mage books, as well as their meta plots, are this. When we play the 5th edition, which is the games you probably currently play, this is the world of darkness you are playing in. The Chronicles of Darkness premiered in 2004 in a book called, and you're gonna have to like bear with me on this for a second, The World of Darkness Storytelling System Rulebook. The new version of this book is called Chronicles of Darkness Revised Storytelling System Rulebook. But in spite of its titular prominence, both the world and the Chronicles of Darkness are based on the storyteller system. The crucial difference is that while the world of darkness has a huge underlying body of continuous lore, and all games of it are at least in some way considered to be taking place in the same continuous universe, this is not so for Chronicles of Darkness, which assumes that every story is essentially a self-contained reality. This was done probably because there's like a lot of lore and players were put off by that and many GMs also had their own ideas as to what the world contained and what its secrets were. There's a much greater focus on small-scale mystery and personal stake storytelling in Chronicles of Darkness as well. All the game lines in Chronicles of Darkness are different from the game lines in World of Darkness, meaning that the supernatural creatures we play function differently, even if they're the same creatures, and their societies are organized differently. Like, for instance, Vampires and Vampire the Requiem don't have generations, and they're not descended of Cain, and they can even switch clans. Except sometimes they're not, uh, and they actually, they work very similarly uh, across both game lines and even have similar societies. Like, clans Gangrel, Nosferatu, and Ventru exist in both vampire universes, and Requiem even had a Camarilla at one point, except it was like a, a particular government of vampires in ancient Rome and no longer exists today, as opposed to the World of Darkness Camarilla, which was founded in the 15th century in England and therefore has absolutely zero overlap with the Chronicles of Darkness Camarilla. All this lore, however, is intentionally kept malleable and subject to broad interpretation, and unlike World of of darkness, you should never assume that you have pre-existing knowledge as a player. Though frankly, if you are playing World of Darkness, also maybe don't assume that too much, it's a, it's a best practice type thing. Now, the thing is that, especially in 5th edition, which some people very confusingly have taken to call the New World of Darkness, even though it is the new law for the Old World of Darkness, the vision for World of Darkness was refocused, especially onto the sorts of personal stake stories that Chronicles of Darkness was supposed to deliver on a ludo-narrative 
mechanical level. Most of the old law is considered implicitly true in the sense that it is apocryphal, but many new works may ignore it and change it. Many people are saying that World and Chronicles are like getting fused, which is to me especially apparent in Hunter the Reckoning 5, uh, which I've also made a whole video on, where basically Chronicles of Darkness, Hunter the Vigil, uh, there you play mortal humans struggling against supernatural forces, right? Uh, and it's basically supplanted the original Hunter the Reckoning as a concept where you used to play supernatural monster hunters called imbued in terms of like themes and feel, because now you're also regular people there, while at the same time acknowledging that some hunters are in fact imbued and have those kinds of magical powers still, which is a change I personally actually quite like because it gives us a broader range of characters that we can play. Which brings us to Werewolf 5, the newest version of the Werewolf game line. Came out just a few months ago, and really, it's the pinnacle of this. Because unlike Vampire and Hunter 5, it explicitly understands itself to be a reboot of the World of Darkness Werewolf the Apocalypse game line. Meaning that they looked at the lore of Werewolf and changed the bits they didn't like as they refocused the vision to once again be more about personal stories and immediate small-scale conflicts. This has generated some controversies, some of it very very justified, I think, and some of it a bit absurd. Overall, the changes are not as dramatic as many people have made them out to be, and there's a lot of misinformation out there as to what the changes actually are. Like, for instance, the Gate of Fenris, contrary to what's been going around, does not in fact serve the worm. That's... That's not the case in Werewolf 5. There's also things decried as changes to the law that are treated as sort of retcons by some people when they're just, uh, you know, changes in the law as time progressive. Like in previous editions of Werewolf, uh, there was the Garu Nation, like a big uh, werewolf government, somewhat international. And in Werewolf 5, that's fallen apart, which is fitting with the new edition's themes, I think. But it, it, it does, it's not like it never existed. We'll cover all this in detail in this video, and whenever there is a significant law divergence in Werewolf 5, I will try to point it out, as well as what the old law was, because I think you can quite easily merge the two in many cases. As being focused on more personal scale stuff, W5 leaves a lot of ambiguity. It is, at the end of the day, your world of darkness. But what is a werewolf, or Garu as they call themselves, and what is it like being one? First off, they're neither humans with wolf souls, nor wolves with human souls, but kind of both, and neither. They're hybrid beings that are in equal parts human and wolf. Another important division of hybridity <laughs> if that's a word, uh, that runs perpendicular to this, essentially, is that they are in equal parts beings of the world of mortals and the world of spirits. This sort of double-dual nature makes them part of many worlds, but really at home in none of them. They can be born of humans and wolves, though most of the werewolves you meet will have been human originally, as it is much easier to adapt to having a wolf part of yourself than it is to having a, a new human part of yourself, right? Like humans have an inherent ability to consider the ramifications of being a wolf, whereas the overwhelming majority of wolves probably have not spent much time thinking about what it would be like to be a human. Nowadays, in 5th edition, it is also possible to effectively steal the ability to become a werewolf, which first requires you to kill a werewolf and remove its pelt. That's already, like, a very dangerous proposition that's probably not going to be crowned by success. And then you also have to perform a really messed up and potentially deadly ritual to wrap yourself in its skin. These shapeshifters are known as Stolen Moons. They're werewolves but not Garu, uh, which if you ask me, Stolen Moons is kind of a garbage name. Uh, they just didn't want to use the term Skinwalker, but you know, you should expect a lot of actual werewolves, especially in America, to refer to them that way, unless they harbor the specific belief that you shouldn't say the word Skinwalker, in which case they might very well use a euphemism like Stolen Moon. Also, I just need to bring out the fact that, like, the changeling Kithane claimed that werewolves are actually descended of fairies. Selkies, which are changelings as well, store their souls and powers in their sealskin furs, which are part of them, and they use that to shapeshift. 
and then they hand them over to the next generation when the time is right. In the classic World of Darkness manner uh, of trying to include every possible archetype of a given supernatural creature that we know from, like, pop media, uh, werewolves can take not two, not three, not four, but five different physical forms. Except Stolen Moons, uh, who can only do three because they're not Garou. They can't mix and match features of the wolf. They can only put on the whole outfit. Among the two simplest is Homid, the human form, wherein you are human. No, seriously, you're just like, a, you're human in this form. Maybe like you're more resilient than an ordinary human. You can take a bullet or two. That's, I mean, uh, some people can do that. But you don't have insane powers of regeneration. Just your human skills and abilities, which in fairness include things like being able to use tools and computers, driving, talking to other humans, walking around without being immediately pegged as a literal monster. Most of the ritualistic magic performed by werewolves require them to be in Homet form. A small bonus here is that while in Homet form you're not affected by the bane of silver, so you can like handle silver like any other human being could. The other pure and simple form is lupus, which is much like the human form except you're a wolf. No regeneration, no allergy to silver, but nonetheless quite useful because while you are driven more strongly by your instincts in this form, you retain your human intelligence for the most part, and though you cannot speak, it is possible for you to communicate with like wolves and werewolves, sometimes even other animals. There's a lot of situations when being a wolf will come in handy, like when you're tracking someone moving through the forest, trying to seem like inconspicuous wildlife in an area where being a human would attract suspicion. If you want to like squeeze your way through tight spaces and shafts where having a horizontal body plan is just a better choice. Not to mention it's also just cool to be a wolf. Then we have the glabro form which could be mistaken for a human at a distance but has some very striking monstrous characteristics that are definitely supernatural upon closer inspection. Glabro's a bigger, stronger, hairier, overall more like beastly, if you will, with fangs, a way of holding themselves that suggests they're about to pounce at any given moment. You can still have a, like a conversation, just not very diplomatically. And you can still use tools, just maybe stay away from surgery. In this form, you are physically formidable and have a limited ability to regenerate damage quickly, but you are vulnerable to silver. Most crucially though, while you are bringing parts of the wolf into play, you are still yourself and in control, mostly. It's pretty easy to shapeshift into this form, you know, it's not very costly, so it comes in handy when you need to rip a door out of its hinges at right that moment. The name Glabro comes from Latin and means hairless, which is an ironic way of saying the werewolf form with the least hair that isn't explicitly just a human. The other side of that coin is the Hispo form, the direwolf. A big and horrible beast that no one will mistake for a dog, and they will freak out over it if they think it is a wolf. It's something you should avoid being while in like a city, given that it is far from inconspicuous, but it can be enormously useful in combat situations, as it is large, tough, strong, it has sharp senses, and some brutal fangs to rip out big chunks of flesh with. When Garu make long treks in the wilderness, they like to be in Hispo form, as it provides all the advantages of being quick and four-legged, while also having a lot of human-level endurance, plus the combination of being attuned to the most minute sounds and smells of the wilderness, combined with, like, human-level navigational intelligence, is hard to beat. The name also derives from Latin and refers to both swelling up in size and being shaggy, which makes sense because it's a big illusion and also the form with the most hair. And then we have Krinos, the final form, or rather the middle form, some would say the highest form, the war form, the fearsome silhouette which drives terror into the bones of the staunchest enemy. The word derives from the Latin for hair, which, uh, there's a lot of hair metaphors in this, and this really is the archetypal werewolf, equal parts man and wolf, and more powerful than simply both mashed together. They are towering hulks of flesh and fur, and possess immense strength, speed, agility, and endurance. They can take a serious beating before they even start to feel the effects, and regenerate 
rapidly. Their claws are razor sharp, their fangs can rip apart even the flesh of vampires. It's not easy to shift into this form though, and once you are in it, you're playing with the fire of bestial rage. You can only stay in control of that rage if you kill, because otherwise it'll eat away at your willpower until you let loose and tear apart whatever's near. It's not really a form you want to spend an extended period of time in if you want to hold on to what makes you human. Though I'm sure the more ideologically extreme werewolves consider it a mark of virtue to do so. Most of them really only do it when they mean business, so if you see a Krenos form werewolf, some serious shit is about to go down. This is actually one of the most controversial changes in Werewolf 5, because you have to spend a point of willpower every round in which you do not kill something while in Krenos form, or you will go into a murderous frenzy. The general consensus in the werewolf community seems to be that, uh, it makes sense they would do this for like the, the aesthetic of the more gritty and personal scope version of Werewolf. Like where a Krenos transformation is always supposed to be a big deal, but it's also a bit harsh. Like as nerfs go, it's, it's, it's maybe a bit much. There's a lot of stuff werewolves need to spend willpower for and they're not mages. They're not practically made of the stuff. Personally, I would sort of run D&D Barbarian rules, ironically, in uh, that you need to do violence to someone or something, prepare to be doing immediate violence or have violence done to you. I think that's a reasonable house rule. Though werewolves are tied to the moon in ways we will discuss in a minute, the lunar phase does not affect their ability to shapeshift. Even the first change, which is the transformation from a human or wolf into werewolf, can happen anywhere and anytime to anyone. It used to be in older editions that werewolves had sort of family lines called kinfolk, whose blood was special, and then one or two each generation, sometimes less, sometimes more, would actually become werewolves. This has been scrapped uh, to be more open and less sort of, I guess like racism coded. A divine right of kings coded, blue blood supremacy coded. I actually think this is a very good change, I'm very happy about this change, but there is a lot of ambiguity with who can actually transform, so there are probably families in which werewolves spawn more frequently than others. If that's something you really want in your game, have at it. The concept of kinfolk has also not been done away with entirely, as your family still is considered your kinfolk, like, ceremonially, and it matters to most werewolf as a crucial connection to their human or wolf lives, who their families were. What the moon does do is decide your auspice, the particular type of werewolf that you are, your character class, if you will. Different auspices have different social rules in Garu society and get away with more stuff if they act according to that social expectation. Auspices also influence what kinds of magical gifts you can acquire from grateful spirits. Your auspice is the determined by the phase of the moon at the time of your first change, with five phases equally split among the five auspices, which of course requires a not-so-strict interpretation of where one phase begins and another ends, so essentially like full moon isn't just one particular night or one particular like second in one particular night, it's actually a couple nights where the moon is sort of full. Many Garu believe that the great spirit Luna, the moon spirit, chooses Garu to experience their first change at just the right moment so that the auspice they get is most in line with their personality. Others point out that it must be random because the first change is usually triggered by some sort of traumatic event, and those happen pretty unexpectedly through a confluence of circumstances. Also, a Garu's auspice does not always match their personality before their first change and many struggle to adapt to the expectations now placed upon them. But that, of course, can be countered with the idea that these sort of seemingly random confluences are exactly the mysterious ways in which spirits work. And just because one's auspice does not perfectly align with one's personality before the change does not mean it isn't exactly what a young Garu needed to become the person they needed to become. Ah, but then why are there rituals that allow one to change one's auspice? Well, that hardly ever happens, and it's also, in some circles, it's just kind of sacrilegious and evil because it disrespects the perfect choice made for you by Luna, which 
You should have respected, you piece of shit. I'm gonna give you fucking taste and my fucking claws up your ass. Yet there's a lot of philosophizing around the campfire about the nature of reality and werewolf because the world is a complicated place. Guru are attuned to mystical forces and have magical powers far beyond just transformation. A lot of that philosophizing is accompanied by sort of violence, of course, you know? A well-placed fist to the throat to make someone shut the fuck up counts as a good argument to many. If your first change happens under a full moon, you become an Arun. A fierce warrior, a berserker in the war for the soul of the earth. To many, especially Arun, this is the truest and purest auspice of what it means to be werewolf. The frontline soldiers, destroyers of evil and corruption, they are always the first to spring into action because they understand that doing something is more important than wasting time deliberating about what should even be done. And destroy is really all they do. They're great at doing violence, but they also solve every problem with violence. They can be sort of reckless jarheads. The worst of Garu impulsiveness and impatience made manifest. If your first change happens under a gibbous moon, you become a Gaillard, a learned lawmaster, a jovial diplomat, a storyteller of the Garu oral and sometimes written down traditions. Stories have a deep connection to the spirit world, and they matter to werewolves in that they make the fight worth fighting, because your glory will be known far and wide. And even if you die, you might become an immortal spirit future Garou will look up to. Of course, you know, just telling stories is a political game inherently. It places the narrative above all else, not the people actually living it. So can you really trust a Gaillard not to do something foolish, or worse, manipulate someone else into doing it just so they can annoy everyone with the tales of some impressive exploit that didn't even really happen that way. If your first change happens under a half moon, you become a Philodox, a level-headed justicar and arbiter of the complex and often ambiguous rules that govern Garu society. Philodoxes like to understand situations and learn more about them before acting rashly. They are trusted to be adjudicators that keep many of the more brash Garu instincts in check before the bill of doing something thoughtless comes due and messes stuff up for the whole community. But they advise caution a lot, and often, you know, need unreasonably high standards of evidence to actually give the green light to do something about a terrible thing that's objectively happening. They also disagree among themselves all the time with vehemence and violence, whether certain traditions still serve the Garu. So really, if they are just making it up as they go along, what gives them the right to judge? If your first change happens under a new moon, you become a ragabash. A cunning rogue and designated troublemaker who gets away with a lot of antics due to a sometimes rather perverse interpretation of jester's privilege. Their job is to pull into question all the rules and hierarchies that govern every given gathering, and they're often rather sly in how they do so. But this almost compulsive skullduggery can get very annoying and very dangerous when they go behind the pack's back to do some seriously illegal and unethical shit because they feel like it's better that way and they think they can get away with it. If your first change happens under a crescent moon, you become a theurge, a hierophant shaman, an envoy to the spirit world. They are the most connected to the mystical forces of the Umbra, of all the Garu, and will usually lead them in ritual, as well as provide guidance. Sometimes that guidance will be metaphorical, sometimes it will be very literal to those who seek it. The urges know about ancient compacts made with spirits eternities ago, and how to deal with these entities, whether by treaties or domination. They are, in fact, so very focused on the high matters of the spirits, that they often lose touch with the real world. They think in time spans far beyond themselves, and care about weird and esoteric laws that inflexible spirits have set almost as much as those spirits themselves do. How are they going to fight for the world if they always have their sights set on what goes on outside of it? The reason werewolves exist in the first place is because they were created 
by the great Earth spirit Gaia, though some say Luna, and all say that Luna clearly has like a hand in the process, obviously, as protectors of the natural world. And there's ample reason even for a mighty spirit like Gaia to be concerned with her own safety, as evidenced by the fact that, you know, She's dead. There's plenty of other extremely powerful spirits out there, and while we are going to go on a little excursion into the spirit world much later in this video, I think it's important to touch upon the central spiritual conflict in this game. The fight against the worm. The middle ombre, the world of spirits, is vast, but it does have three tent poles. The wild, the weaver, and the worm. These are, in a sense, the most powerful spirits, controlling the cycle that makes up all of existence. But to call them that is a little misleading and sort of human-minded. They're not like the rulers of the spirit world, but they may be its gods in like a Spinoza's god type of way. When it comes to spirits, everything is inherently beyond human understanding and can only be perceived through a particular lens. Even mages do it like that. In its natural state, the wild is a force of unbridled change in creation, being emerging from non-being without sense or purpose. It's a limitless wellspring of chaos brimming with potential. The Weaver is the order imposed upon that chaos, patterns stabilized and defined, made more than just potential but actualized into a definitive existence and kept in a certain shape to stave off collapse. The worm takes this order and collapses it, breaking down all that is into the is-not, an all-consuming gullet of entropy, the annihilation eternal of all patterns and even their echoes, and records and memory over long periods of time. And then from this uncreation, the wild creates new chaos. When these forces are in equilibrium, they are the natural state of the universe. They are, like all spirits, especially those representing fundamental forces, not moral agents in that sense. They certainly are beings of intelligence, vast intelligence, far beyond human understanding, but they do not have a choice in being what they are, because what they are is what they do, and if they did not do as they are, they would not be. I'm sorry if this is like extremely esoteric, uh, this sort of animist cosmology is what underpins the spiritual elements of Werewolf. What I'm saying is that like neither the triad nor any element of it is like good or bad. But while they are working the way they're supposed to be working, they are right in the sense that they are true. But the triad is not in balance, it's not working the way it's supposed to be working, and it hasn't for a very long time. At some point eons ago, the Weaver, in its purpose to maintain order, decided to get rid of the one thing that was destroying that order. The Worm. Since it couldn't destroy the worm, it trapped the worm, fixing it into a definite state. But that is not how the worm is supposed to exist, so it ended up mutating. Starvation made it ravenous, and straining against its bonds made it strong. So now, even though it is still bound, or so many believe, it is more powerful and aggressive than ever, making it the worm defiler that's been consuming Gaia by the mouthful. The, wi the wild is also there. It's it's there as well. It's, it's still sort of doing its thing and all this. Now, this conflict is uh, metaphysical, and it's sort of a metaphor for what is happening in the world, right? The wild represents the, the natural environment and its gifts, as well as human ingenuity. Uh, the weaver represents the making into those gifts, into human civilization, and the worm is the destruction that this causes. Basically, if, if you haven't caught on, uh, werewolf is about environmental destruction as well as the exploitation of human suffering. And it always has been. Like, I've seen, I've seen a few, not many, honestly, but like a few voices that like lamented this change in Werewolf 5 because, oh, now they put politics in the game. I don't know what kind of chronicles you've been running, uh, but this game has always been about like politics, about activism, its issues and pitfalls, ideological fervor, fighting for the good cause and how it's not always clear what the good cause even is, the road to hell paved with good intentions. Everything in the world is a manifestation of some aspect of the triad, even other supernatural beings. 
Vampires, for instance, are associated with the weaver, though some individual ones are also associated with the worm. Changelings are associated with the wild, springing from dreams and human imagination. Spectres are associated with the worm, being entities consumed with the will of destruction of both themselves and the world. Farmers, artists, teachers are associated with the wild. Construction workers, judges, historians are associated with the weaver. Garbage workers, undertakers, and executioners are associated with the worm. Trees, rivers, clouds are associated with the wild. Roads, houses, and books are associated with the weaver. Fires, diseases, rats are associated with the worm. And also, very crucially, most spirits are not directly part of the triad. They don't serve the triad necessarily, though they themselves may be associated with the processes it represents at any given time. Certain subcategories of any of these things may not fit neatly into any one aspect of the triad, and they don't have to. A dead tree that still stands could be associated with all three of them, really. These are labels that Garou assign in their worldview to represent a reality that is much too complex to abide by arbitrary taxonomy, but which still somehow needs to be made sense of. The problem is that the worm now also manifests as oil spills, nuclear bombs, and serial killers, which are in and of themselves complicated because oil would be ordinarily used to maintain the order of society, the uranium was enriched through wild energies, and a serial killer can be super creative. There's a whole ass mega corporation called Pentex that's acting as an agent of the worm. Pretty explicitly, actually, and directly. They are aware of the existence of shapeshifters, spirits, and various other supernatural entities. Some of some supernatural entities are part of, like, Pentex, and they are themselves followers of the spirit totem of the fly. You've never heard of them because they have stakes in all the other evil corporations in the world through an endless shell game of false fronts, and also because they certainly make for a great shadow antagonist that functions as a stand-in for the sort of corporate corruption inherent to the infinite growth mindset of capitalism. They also exist for the rather simple out-of-game reason that Werewolf is like a small-time role-playing game, and a lot of these companies are extremely powerful and have destroyed lives to protect their image. These groups are fucking insidious and smart in the way they do propaganda. Like, remember how you probably learned about your personal carbon footprint in school? You maybe had to even calculate it using some online tool? Yeah, that shit was made up by the marketing firm Ogilvy and Mather, which actually served as the inspiration for the television show Mad Men for British Petroleum. BP as just one of the many approaches the fossil fuel industry's prolonged campaign to make the general population feel responsible for climate change and shift the focus of activism and legislation away from themselves, which they have done very effectively. Basically, back in the day, White Wolf and nowadays Paradox, they just, uh, they just, they don't want to run the risk of being buried in bullshit lawsuits by corporations with infinitely deep pockets who have been known to use every dirty trick in the book to continue destroying the planet. That's why Pentex exists as the ultimate manifestation of that, except it doesn't exist in the real world, so they can't, you know, sue them. And you don't even need to have it in your game if you prefer to call the devil by its name in your own house. I personally like to run Pentex as more of a consulting firm for these sorts of of mega corporations instead of their puppet masters, because they are, of course, primarily concerned with further unbalancing the triad. Garou opinions on, like, the personhood and even the existence of the triadic spirits are divided in a way they've never been before. Some really do just think of them as a metaphorical framework to make sense of the world. In fact, the whole worldview of the Garou, the triad and spirits and all that, is probably going to be sort of culturally translated and slotted into whatever framework any individual Garou can relate to. A very Catholic Garou Karen in an ancient Bavarian church might see the wild as the divine energy of creation, the weaver as the worldly efforts of man, and the worm as the evil works of the devil. They probably still refer to them by the terms wild weaver and worm when talking to other Garu of different cultures, but this is how they interpret it. The up until very recently rather blasphemous idea that uh, it is actually perhaps not the worm but the weaver that is the enemy, as the worm's corruption is a consequence of its actions, has also been gaining traction. There are those who 
think of the worm as evil and those who think of the worm as just following its essence and thereby doing bad things only from the perspective of Gaia, which relies on this sort of balance, but is being consumed whole by the worm. And to protect Gaia is, after all, what Garu are made to do. So, consequently, logically, the worm is the enemy. And they took their job so seriously that they, they protected the shit out of Gaia to the extent where, like, they would regularly go to war with other kinds of shapeshifters that were also created by Gaia for reasons other than to protect her. Because, I mean, if you're not protecting her, what are you doing, really? Like, what, what is it that you are doing if you're not protecting? It's kind of suspicious. This is known as the War of Rage, both referring to a specific escalation of that conflict and frequent outbreaks of skirmishes and minor such wars throughout history and before history. Also, for an extended period of time during the dawn of civilization, werewolves reigned over humans in a way that some gangsters do, and frequently attempted to wipe them out entirely. This was known as the Impergium, and the pogroms and hunts left such a scar on the collective human psyche that we have an ancestral terror of werewolves known as delirium. Essentially, any non-supernatural human sees the Krenos form werewolf and it's rapidly caught in the grips of terror. How exactly this manifests, whether like we freeze in place or we run away screaming or we punch the enormous fang monster charging at us in the nozzle, it depends on the person in question, and some are more affected by delirium than others. But it always includes some element of rationalization, be it in the moment or post hoc, of just like forgetting the entire situation or making up false memories that make the fact that werewolves exist not be floating around our minds. Provided we survive, of course, which is, you know, that's not usually the case. Werewolves are instruments of violence, after all. Uh, factories of rage. Cap capital R rage. This is an in-game resource. You know, like blood is for vampires. Rage is what uh, werewolves use to protect Gaia from the ravages of greedy humans. It's what they fuel their powers with and what they use to transform into their monstrous forms. It's the defining emotion of their existence, and therein lies the problem, because as everyone who has ever tried to effectively protect anything may have noticed, Anger issues are only useful in some, like, very narrow aspects of that, and can be pretty detrimental in others. You can destroy logging equipment, sure, and you can even kill the blue-collar guys that are trying to make a buck to feed their families, but that's not actually going to stop the capital machine from buying new equipment. In fact, the construction of that equipment will require the extraction of resources elsewhere, and you sure as shit are not touching the boardroom executives who make those decisions. The machine regenerates faster than you can destroy it, so take your meaningless little victories, because unless you build something in the space you cleared, something permanent that will withstand the enormous pressure of that machine, you are going to be fighting forever without actually ever getting anything done. And building, abolishing, putting in place alternative systems, maintaining those systems, it's not something werewolves are suited to doing. Like, rage and claws will not help you maintain a housing co-op or an organic farm. A little ferocity may help you if you are elected to sit at the helm of a credit union, but most of that work is pushing numbers and managing people you want to be loyal to you, not terrified. It's work so devoid of fury that you will run the risk of losing the wolf inside of you entirely, which is something that can and will happen, and when it does, you need to work hard to win it back if you even want to at all. Werewolves are passionate creatures of emotional extremes, which can also be dangerous because they can get almost metaphysically locked into one of them, and then it's almost impossible to pull them out again. But even there, there's a spectrum, so you don't always know whether someone is experiencing one of these extreme emotional states. The emotion becomes part of them, it's something that, an emotion that you usually also have, it's just driven up to an extreme. It seeps into their personality more than usual, but because they are they are, and people do change over time, you don't always see it before it's too late. There are two of these states, Hirano and Hauglosk. Hirano is a state of deep disillusionment and depression. It's the, the, the loss of the will to fight, the inability to channel rage to wage war on behalf of Gaia. And I mean, 
how could you not get depressed, right? Like, when you realize how invincible the opponent is, how unwinnable the war, how unsuited you and your fellow Guru actually are at defeating the corruption and environmental pollution that is killing, nay, has killed, Gaia? The problem with Hirano is that people who suffer from it will often advocate temperance and restraint, which in many situations is actually going to be entirely prudent and a good idea, and something especially elder werewolves are expected to do in order to temper the destructive passions of their younger kin. And it's a very bad idea to accuse an elder of having fallen to Hirano at the moot just because they said you shouldn't go to the bar and slaughter all the miners celebrating a big birthday there. Unless you are looking to get torn to shreds, that is. The inverse is how Glosk, the state of infinite rage, the endless battle frenzy in which you are nonetheless sharp and of human mind. As opposed to like a regular frenzy where your inner monster takes over and which is also limited in time, which how Glosk isn't. It's the Garu blunt instrument mentality driven not to 11 but to 12 and you become an active danger even to your fellow Garu because every second you spend not slaughtering and destroying is a second wasted, and those who waste time in the fight against the worm are basically servants of the worm that ought to be slaughtered themselves. It's hard to detect how Glosk as well sometimes, uh, because many Garu think it's a sign of weakness to not believe you can just Johnny Silverhand against the machine until the machine is broken. You'll become a target of ridicule, and often even like accusations of being a, a corruption sympathizer or some other weird made up in the moment political epithet, so it's pretty normal for werewolves to really play up their rage to avoid such accusations or gain political support among hardliners who desperately want to think the world is simple. There's a whole tribal werewolf that's in a permanent state of Halglosk, essentially, and we'll talk about them later. It should be noted that Halglosk is actually new in 5th edition. Hirano has been around for a while, but part of the W5 design philosophy has been to capture the nuance that just blind rage and anger is actually not just good, and can be extremely ineffective and even hinder the goals you are trying to achieve. Some people are unhappy with that, I don't actually hate it, I just think it ought to be possible to regulate both of these states more finely and bring Garu back from them, like, explicitly. The way they describe sometimes makes them seem like end states, while I think they're much more interesting as plot hooks. To illustrate the pitfalls uh, of the thoughtlessness and flat-out arrogance with which Garu operate when they don't take the time Time to put in legwork, it's actually a very common belief among Garu that young vampires look like humans and old vampires look weird and deformed. If you know anything about vampires, you know that this is very much not true, but as a werewolf you might gain the impression that Vampires are not actually particularly dangerous when you uh, handle an elder vampire, which was in fact like a fledgling Nosferatu that didn't even have double digits of eternal life under its belt. This mistake would cost you dearly when you realize the evil club owner who is a vampire looks like a regular person and so you conclude she's easily dealt with. It's just that this thousand year old Toreador already smelled you and your gang when you crawled out of the can this morning and could give you all an aneurysm by flashing some titty. And this is why, despite their overwhelming zeal, werewolves didn't actually manage to protect Gaia. They failed. The game is called Werewolf the Apocalypse, but it really should be called Werewolf the Post-Apocalypse, because Gaia is dead. Or if not, she, you know, she is a di difficult thing with spirits. She's certainly on her last few breaths. Some still hold on to hope, but there's nothing that can be done to save her. Other shapeshifters may be good at some of that, but werewolves have killed so many of those that they're politically alienated from them and their causes. Nobody trusts werewolves, not even werewolves themselves. The political divisions run really fucking deep among the tribes. It really is like the experience of being a leftist sometimes. I mean, it's, 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 unca it's, really, it's uncanny. <laughs> there used to be something called the Garu Nation. 
there isn't such a thing anymore. Its purpose was to organize the vastly differing tribes and philosophies and unite them against the apocalypse. But the apocalypse has happened. Like, it's, it's a done deal. It's a lost battle. Or so most Garu believe. This has destroyed the political cohesion of the Garu nation. It's a change that many players don't really like, uh, though I personally think it, it just makes sense politically. Uh, but if you like the concept of the Garu Nation, I'm sure there's a lot of people in places who don't agree that it's no longer a thing and where it may very well still be a significant power. What a lot of players are a bit more pissed off about is how they changed the tribes. And they did change the tribes quite a bit. Uh, I don't really think it's a great idea how... They did it. I don't think it was motivated uh, by a desire to tell the best possible story why they did it. But I also think there's a lot of potential here to make this the best and most nuanced interpretation of tribes ever, if only we don't entirely discard the old law, and we actually take the new law changes seriously, because some of them are quite good. There are 11 different tribes of Garu in Werewolf 5th Edition, 14 if you count the ones that are not available to player characters, and what you may have heard is that the tribes are different now than they were in the old law, obviously. They don't even have the same names, and they don't have the same past. I get why one would be irritated by this, uh, I don't think think it's the worst change in the world, and I'll explain why. But first, we have to talk about what a tribe even is, because it's not so much a family uh, or some uh, like genetically related grouping of Garu. It's first and foremost a political organization with a strong spiritual component. They are essentially nations without territory, if you will, political parties. It's normal and in fact common for pacts to contain members of different tribes, and for cans, which are werewolf gathering places of significant spiritual power, to be maintained and protected by local members of different tribes working together. Though their goals may not always be perfectly aligned, uh, their differences make it so they have more to gain from working together than going against each other. A young Garu chooses their tribe, and the tribe chooses them. And it does happen that Garu may change tribes if their views or the views of that tribe become irreconcilable. It's not something that happens very often, though. Each tribe has a totem as its patron spirit, which aligns with its philosophy and gives the tribe a magical gift, but also forbids the tribe from certain actions, though transgressing against this doesn't mean you get immediately kicked or something. Each tribe used to also have a cultural affectation. Well, most of them did, at least. And in Werewolf 5, they got rid of this. And it has a lot of people very up in arms that the Black Furies are no longer defined by their Greek mythology aesthetic, among other things. I know why they did this. Uh, and it's the, uh, the same reason why they got rid of certain tribes altogether. They did not want ostensibly cosmopolitan political forces to bear a certain aesthetic that is evocative of a particular time and place, right? Because if that aesthetic is something European, it's Eurocentric. If it's not, it's always some sort of fetishization of indigenous cultures. You can't really win when you do this. Somebody online is going to start a shitstorm no matter what you do. And so what Paradox did, and what many of these companies do, is they hire sensitivity consultants and the like, and what they ask those consultants is, hey, how do I represent this indigenous culture accurately in a way that no one will complain about, guaranteed? And the answer, always, inevitably, is, well, every culture and every cultural concept is inherently diverse in how the people of that culture relate to it and interpret it. And no matter what you do, someone from that culture, or someone speaking on that culture's behalf, is going to get mad. Because, you know, maybe it's not their particular view of that element you are putting into fiction, and their view is just as valid as your interpretation, but you don't want them to get mad in the first place. You can't really be authentic and accurate at the same time. These two things are mutually exclusive. At least this is what they'll say if they're not fucking hacks. And unfortunately, the consulting industry is pretty much defined by hacks. 
in every field. And then the publishing corporation goes, all right, we're getting rid of any references to real world culture completely. And we're not working with anyone's cultural trappings in a creative, like interesting or authentic way by actually doing the work of learning about it. Because that's expensive and we have deadlines and someone will still get mad when we do it. So what's the point? Uh, but then they tend to keep a lot of the European based stuff because it, it, it doesn't really matter when this sort of cultural distortion gets complained about by white people. So you'll get shit like them renaming the Samedi bloodline in Vampire into the Nation of Blood because they don't want real world religious figures in their game, where vampires are literally called K-Knights and are canonically cursed by the Christian God. They're kind of being the weaver, but being so afraid of the worm that they end up trapping the wild. Some of the tribes like the Wendigo were so inextricably linked with their cultural aesthetic that they would not work in a framework like this at all. And let's be serious, they were originally in there to sort of fill the niche of ethnic werewolves, so they were struck from the canon basically completely. I don't think that this is necessarily the right approach to doing this sort of thing, especially given that one of the key political conflicts in Garu culture, across the United States at least, uh, was that all these European colonizer tribes with their ideology-defined allegiance came over and tried to impose their order on the indigenous werewolves called the Pure Tribes, uh, whose philosophy very much was being inherently tied to the land and the people. There were whole tracts about the arrogance of the white werewolf lineages who had alienated themselves from the world they lived in and the humans they coexisted with. Telling the pure ones how to fight the battle against Gaia and bringing in their weird genocidal tendencies. But they got rid of all that because we don't want to be accused of otherizing by pointing out the fact that there are others. There are, in fact, people who are different from you. And that's fine. It's fine that they are there. But actually, let's not mention that. I think this general trend just encourages the omission of non-white cultural representation for cynical PR reasons, thereby ultimately achieving the exact opposite of what the good cultural consultants are trying to do. And also a very real practice of otherization and mystification of foreign cultures instead of actually trying to engage with them in a meaningful way. Oh no, don't be in touch with a different thing. You'll do it wrong and you'll hurt them somehow. It's just, it's such a, a different way of, of breeding reactionary fear toward foreign cultures. It's just wearing a mantle of inclusivity. It creates a sort of cultural hierarchy in which the modern European derived culture must patronizingly protect the purer indigenous cultures from the exploitation that it itself does to preserve a vague vibe of authenticity by ultimately concealing the humanity of those cultures. Because when you portray an indigenous culture doing something evil, that that's bad. And when you portray them doing something good, that's fetishizing. When in fact it should be neither, because every culture has a right to be as nuanced and grey as every other. And every human being has the same moral agency as any other. This is not something we can deny certain cultures just to hoard all the guilt for ourselves. You may have noticed that I have a, a bit of a chip on my shoulder about the white bourgeois intelligentsia instrumentalizing indigenous cultures for their own spiritual atonement over shit they had no hand in just to make themselves look good in their own circles and think of themselves as morally superior because they engaged in self-flagellation over guilt porn. But then I also don't subscribe to the idea that it's racist not to believe in witchcraft. So what do I know, really? We're getting markedly off topic. This was not supposed to be a political video, but it's a game about politics. Aside from all that, I still think this new way of doing tribes uh, without most of them being tied to some sort of cultural aesthetic has a lot of redeeming qualities. And if it didn't come with the baggage that it does, I might even prefer it because it doesn't make too much immediate sense to have some Tatar of the steppes living in a yurt 
uh, having a dream catcher, right? Because, you know, that's just the aesthetic of their tribe, so they have to have one. But at the same time, I see a great opportunity here, because culture has been syncretized forever. That's how culture happens, and has always happened. And the channels through which this happens are essentially infinite. A political organization will have certain cultural practices and symbols to represent itself. And if that organization formed at a particular time and place, or was defined by a particular time and place, it makes sense that certain symbols would be removed from their original cultural context and transplanted into different cultural context through time and space, especially if it's not managed by a corporate PR team. If your political organization is big and widespread enough, and I think for Garu tribes this like very much applies, they probably will have different regional factions and subgroups that use some symbols and not others. And maybe none at all, and they have like a strong aesthetic of their own because they have a particular relation to their land and culture that represents uh, the philosophy of that tribe very well. I think especially in the United States, you'd expect more syncretism than anywhere else in the world, but I still see no reason why that Central Asian steppe nomad should not have a Dreamcatcher. After all, the Dreamcatcher was originally an Ojibwe thing, but it caught on so much that you have some variation of it in most North American indigenous cultures. I have one! It's right there. I don't know if it's in the frame. It's... I'm not, I don't want to take it off. It's a bit fragile. Uh, a few people have actually criticized me for owning this. I've had this since I was a baby. Like, seriously, I can't remember a time when I didn't have this. It was a gift from my mother, and I've always had a genuine engagement with it. It's always been a part of my life, and it's a symbol to me that I find meaning in. My point being, you can run these tribes with their original cultural aesthetics so long as you don't force it upon all its members, and understand the different cultures and individuals around the world, who are part of this organization certainly, they're still going to dress their own way too. And I further believe that sometimes these political affiliations with the tribes may not be primarily philosophical, but may be actually tied to a place and a part particular culture. That particular tribe's interpretation of their culture may be extremely idiosyncratic and diverge from what most of the members of that culture believe, but that's valid, because they're not humans. They're werewolves. They have a very different lived experience. So if you want to have the Wendigo tribe as part of your chronicle, I think you absolutely still can, especially if you run it as a faction within a given tribe. The tribes and what they represent have changed canonically over the millennia. There's been splits, new tribes have formed, old tribes have died out. Culture is not neat. It's disorderly. Also, they can't unprint previous editions of Werewolf, so... I will still be talking about some of those no longer canonical tribes and try to give a general idea of the old law, as well as how to implement some of the old law into this new werewolf paradigm. The Black Furies are angry at the overwhelming injustice in the world. Sexism, racism, police brutality, economic inequality, every single one of them has a chip on their shoulder about some systemic problem that just pisses them off. And they want to do something about it, urgently. In this, they're sort of the bruja of the werewolf world. Unfortunately, in the process of doing so, they can be a little gung-ho with the no-holds barred. They do not generally believe in patience, but they do believe in smashing systemic oppression and its agents at all costs, without much room for compromise. Small victories do not matter to the Black Furies, and since they believe their cause is just, they will happily throw a wrench into any finely laid plan or operation other Garou have put in place, if that operation would settle for less than what the marginalized deserve. Though they generally support each other and like to engage in highly effective public activism, sometimes their solidarity can be cut a little short if they feel like another Black Fury is too dedicated to the wrong cause, to the detriment of their own. Sometimes these causes can be very idiosyncratic and reductive. You'll find, like, environmentalists who advocate human genocide, radical feminists who think that trans people and men are the enemy, and anarchists who think all lawyers should just be murdered. You'll find these people just as readily as you will genuine intersectionalists who operate from a place of kindness. Their patron spirit is Gorgon from Greek myth. You may know Medusa, she was a Gorgon, and it's a spirit of revenge against injustice both real and perceived. 
She favors fighting abuse and discrimination wherever and whenever it can be found, clawing at authority even just to have done it, and bans not doing that when you would have been in a position to make a difference, even if the act of making a difference would have cost you. In the old law, the Black Furies were structurally very different, as they comprised pretty much exclusively women. They were hardcore radical feminists, and many had a real hate boner for men. Amazon warriors who were actually not as supportive of the feminist movement as you might expect in modern days, while at the same time bearing partial responsibility for some of its more racist and classist elements in the past. Their patron spirit used to be Pegasus, not Gorgon, whose purpose was to protect that which is holy and support women by carrying them on his back. Their aesthetic was of course ancient Greek, consequently, especially items of the female priesthood that was very prevalent in many periods of ancient Greece. And I think you could introduce certain factions within the Black Furies that only accept women. If you're open to the idea that there might be secondary totems certain members of a tribe could choose as their patron, and some of those old school Black Furies might even still be pledged to Pegasus. Some classic Black Furies characters might be a firebrand union organizer in rural West Virginia, an old IRA frontline warrior missing the glory days of the Troubles, or a teenager in Compton who is taken to killing cops that murder unarmed black kids. The Black Spiral Dancers are a corrupted and broken tribe that actually serves the worm, not Gaia, and is thus one of the tribes not available to player characters as of Werewolf 5. They used to be known as the White Howlers and were flipped when they found an opportunity to plunge right into the dark lair of the Worm, a realm known as Malpheus, but instead found themselves trapped in an endless physics-defying labyrinth decorated with maddening black spirals. In the labyrinth, they were torn up and lost, even when they tried to stay together, and had their wills broken by the superior might of the worm. They realized that the worm was simply too powerful, too supreme to be fought, and the only rational thing to do would be to serve it as the ultimate natural fate of the universe. So now they walk the world in their twisted and mutated forms, only vaguely resembling Garu. And seeing Gaia dead, their cousins going through the various stages of grief about it, they feel entirely vindicated. Now it's time to chow down on the spoils and speed up the destruction. Their motivation here is not like super rational, though they may strongly rationalize it, they are kind of broken-minded. The patron spirit is Bat, whom they encountered in the Black Spiral Labyrinth, replacing Lion, who had been the patron of the White Howlers however many eons ago. Bat offered to guide the tribe out of the labyrinth, but did so only after their will was broken. It's not clear what it favors or bans in 5th edition, but in old editions it favored recognizing things that would otherwise remain unperceived, and banned physically harming other shapeshifters, which, you know, given that the Black Spiral dancers will attack other Garu in 5th edition, is clearly not the case here anymore. This was originally so because Bat was a servant of the pure Bat balanced worm, which is supposedly still imprisoned somewhere within Malpheus, but has in itself been split and corrupted. And the old law, the Black Spiral Dancers had pretty much the same story, though with the additional information that the White Howlers were originally a Pictish tribe in Northern Britain, so it, like what today is Scotland, during the Roman invasion of the British Isles. So perhaps in addition to the spirals, you might find plenty of Pictish symbology among them, a lot of which also includes spirals. The main difference is that though they encountered Bat in the Black Spiral Labyrinth, their new patron spirit ultimately became the Whippoorwill, a really weird looking bird that was actually a sort of demon known as a Bane, which we will get into later, Banes are very interesting, and he allowed them to imitate bird calls but also banned them from harming birds, which Honestly, not very strong in terms of theme, I have to say. Some classic Black Spiral Dancer characters might be an advertising consultant working in a greenwashing agency, a hitman who goes after journalists and environmental activists, or an apex predator hunting specifically animals close to extinction. The Bone Knowers find that the muck and the filth, the pile of leftovers, makes for a pretty decent way to live, actually, if you play your cards right. They're at home on the fringes of society, living unseen among the 
unseen, happy to scrounge and scavenge and in the process find goods and knowledge that no one else would even have tried to get their hands on. In that sense, they're sort of like the Nosferatu of the werewolf world. You'll find them among the homeless, embedded in criminal organizations, with the artists and the non-corporate queers, the pimple-faced colder societies, and disenfranchised workers who sometimes, let's be fair, have less than savory views on minorities because they're constantly bombarded with that sort of propaganda. They keep their eyes and ears open, and when somebody needs something got, be it information, hardware, or a person, the burn Norse can get it done. As you might imagine, they're not exactly considered high society in Garu circles, though probably one or two of them are butlers and maids, and so know a lot more about high society and its secret etiquette than most of the high and mighty can leaders do. Their intelligence, ingenuity, and let's be fair, loose morals when it comes to getting results are indispensable, though. I mean, shit, they're one of the few tribes that places a high value on having a good education, though so to them, that doesn't necessarily mean being a scientist or academic. Their patron spirit is Rat, a survivalist spirit of the hidden and the unwanted, who favors digging for valuable information and to actually make use of it instead of sitting on it, unless sitting on it is accomplishing a purpose in and of itself. It also cares about the dregs of society, so it bans not using the opportunity to help oppressed outsiders in a meaningful, non-symbolic way when it presents itself. In the old law, they were actually pretty similar, a, a group originally formed of the outcasts from other tribes. Bono used to be a bit of an insult for bottom feeders and these sorts of outcasts, but they eventually started wearing it with pride, as often happens. After all, the bones are full of tasty and nourishing marrow. It's the same with detritus falling from high society. Like, you wouldn't believe the shit that some people just throw away. They had a strong trash punk aesthetic, finding meaning in urban decay and the things creative minds with little in the way of resources did with it, persevering in the face of the worm. Magical rituals they perform should probably involve, like, graffiti, pizza, and colorful plastic bags in some form. There's beauty and genuine camaraderie down where no one else will look, if you are willing to find it. Some classic Bone Noir characters might be a foreign spy in Berlin who now has a bit of a conflict of interest with their former employer because they're a werewolf, a technician plumbing the depths of the London Underground, or a smuggler running the Mexico-Californian border. The children of Gaia are of an unorthodox orthodoxy, dedicated to Gaia and seeing the key to her protection and understanding her secrets and healing her wounds. They do not agree that the apocalypse has happened and that Mother Earth is dead, and they think that in order to save her, the Garu need to lift their noses off the path of rage and look at the bigger picture, act with thought, understand why things are happening, so when they do something about them, they can actually be effective. The Umbra is full of mysteries that need to be understood somehow, and so is the material world. And then it's also all interconnected as well, cause and effect propagating in unlikely ways, wings of a butterfly, hurricane and all that, sometimes strengthening or mending a connection can actually be much more useful than severing one. They think most Garu are narrow-minded, though nonetheless extremely useful if appropriate appropriately cared for. To just keep going, rage-fueled in the face of destruction just to prove how dedicated you are is selfish to them. Gaia needs you healthy next month to achieve a meaningful victory, not dead tomorrow because you chose to take out another replaceable corporate goon. A lot of the more politically severe tribes don't love this philosophy of inaction and think that the children of Gaia clothe themselves in the aesthetic of dedication to Mother Earth to obfuscate their cowardice. They're also one of the tribe's most tolerant of humans, seeing them as an obvious part of the whole and valuable in the protection of Gaia and the fight against the Worm Defiler, which can be an unpopular opinion depending where you are. All things being equal though, their advice is usually at least seriously considered, if for no other reason than every leader with half a brain knows that the children of Gaia know things that most wouldn't even care to look for. Their patron spirit is Unicorn, a fleeting, illusory spirit of hidden things and the desire to see 
and understand them. It represents the holistic beauty of the natural world and how it's disappearing and favors the exploration of the interrelatedness of all things. Slippery though it is, it's not fond of deception because that clouds understanding and so bans lying, especially if it's done for personal gain. In the old law, they're not that different, acting as diplomats between tribes, a faction that is beyond question in its dedication to Gaia, and really what is diplomacy if not healing, so that's still their role in most disputes. Their aesthetic was very like nature hippie focused because they had a special relationship with Gaia as the tribe descended from her most innocent and idealistic firstborn that were like sort of slaughtered. Even the unicorn totem was pretty similar, like with a bigger focus on non-violence, but the elements of umbral delving and seeking to understand before striking were already there very prominently. Some classic Children of Gaia characters may be a primary care physician in Zimbabwe, trying to appease groups of agitated spirits there, a geologist studying volcanoes on Hawaii, or a mushroom grower in rural Brabant, trying to create stuff that will fill the people who consume it with more empathy. The Ged of Fenris are consumed with rage and seething hatred for the world, and have heard themselves at it with reckless abandon. In other words, they're all as a collective tribe caught in a perpetual state of Halglosk that will make them tear to shreds even their fellow Garu. Much like the White Howlers a long, long time ago, in the final days of Apocalypse, they saw an opportunity to strike at the heart of the worm and they took it. Given that this is what sort of turned the White Howlers into the Black Spiral Dancers eventually, I'm saying chances are if it probably it won't end the way that they imagined it, but they are still fighting. This event is actually what collapsed the Garu Nation originally, and I guess technically they're no longer called the Geta Fenris, but the Cult of Fenris, which was a particular sort of super extreme movement within the Geta Fenris, but many use the terms interchangeably, and I get just sounds cooler than cult. Whatever you choose to call it, it's not a playable tribe in Werewolf 5. Though there is a lore sheet for characters that used to be Geta Fenris, but left the tribe when it became too politically extreme. Though they are called in Collective Hauglosk, they're not all firming at the mouth beasts, and can actually be quite cunning in how they still manipulate Garu politics, always coaxing them into pushing hard in an all-out, no-holds-barred war against the world. This can make them easy to manipulate in turn if you want to throw them off your pack scent by convincing them maybe that there is a bigger and more immediate fight against the worm to be had, though that may come back to bite you when it turns out it was bullshit and you are now a worm-tainted deceiver in their eyes. Their patron spirit is wolf, which, it, yeah, it, that's kind of ironic that like the wolf totem Werewolf Tribe is no longer inside the Overton window of werewolf politics. It's not known what it favors and what it bans, though if old lore and pack culture is anything to go by, it probably favors acts of daring heroism and bans foregoing the opportunity to prove yourself. In the old lore, the Get was very extreme, often very anti-human, but mainly focused on war, combat, proving yourself winning battles, like the whole like violent alpha male bullshit, that was what the Geta Fenris was all about. They weren't really retconned so much as just brought to their logical conclusion. Their totem is marginally different, as in like in the old lore it was Fenris, which is obviously a big fuck off wolf. They had this uh, Norse aesthetic going on, which of course does not work internationally very well, but the trappings of which they probably still use very liberally, especially now that this specific Scandinavian based faction has completely taken over the tribe. With the fractal nature of spirits, Fenris can easily be interpreted as being an aspect or particular incarnation of Wolf. Some classic Get of Fenris characters might be a rampaging serial killer in rural Indiana, an impassioned agitator who just shows up to public moods in cans all over Greece to get people riled up, or a threshold guardian of the Umbra and the Black Forest, killing everyone who tries to enter the local spirit world because they are worm-tainted. The Gale Stalkers are hunters in the purest form, single-minded in their pursuit of prey. They're not about the politics and they're not about the carnage, they're about the game of chase. Exemplars of what Garu could and should be if the world was not rolling downhill 
very fast. They do, of course, still fight for Gaia. They are, after all, warriors. And they're very useful because you can point them at someone or something that needs taking down and they will do it. Might take a while, but no prey is too large for them. Many of them are nomads who travel in pursuit of their prey, but just as many live in a particular place that they know inside out and where none can hide from them. All you need to do is drive an enemy of the Garu into their particular valley, bay or neighborhood, and they will find them. This goes beyond the material world and human targets. They're just as happy to hunt spirits and monsters, be they bane, mutated fomori, or vampires. Even human hunters often find themselves hunted by gale stalkers instead. While they're held up as like a great ideal in Garu society, their myopic preoccupation with the craft often makes them miss the bigger picture, and their general lack of interest in the politicking of what remains of the Garu nation often makes them go along with whoever's promising the biggest mammoth to hunt, regardless of whether or not it actually can be realistically hunted. This sort of simple-minded political apathy makes them a, a primal conservative force, if you will. Their patron spirit is the North Wind, a powerful and unceasing force of nature that's always blowing and never ceases, giving the Gale Stalkers seemingly endless endurance in the pursuit of their prey. At the same time, it bans not indulging in one's hunger and demands that the Gale Stalkers eat a fresh kill every day. As you can probably imagine, this can make them somewhat conspicuous in many areas where even animals are tracked by rangers and where leaving a trail of bodies can call the attention of all the wrong authorities. Hunters know what to look out for when it comes to werewolves. In the old lore, the Gale Stalkers didn't exist. That's right, they're, they're new, they were made up fresh for 5th edition. They were absolutely Garu that sort of fulfilled this uh, hunter archetype, and they do have elements of various tribes that no longer exist, especially the Wendigo, but even there the connections are rather tenuous. However, if you recall the very beginning of this video, you might think, hey, hang, ha, hang on, wait a minute, dedicated to the hunt, that sounds like the Chronicles of Darkness flavored werewolves. And I really honestly personally think that that is at least in part where they were going with this. If you want some level of continuity, you could of course say that they had always existed, uh, but weren't explicitly part of the Garu Nation, or they're like a newly formed tribe in these post-apocalypse times of Garu that are like somewhat kind of uh, societal breakaways from all the politics, that have realized you, you do actually kind of need to participate in the politics if you don't want the world to end. Some classic Gale Stalker characters might be a bounty hunter in the southwest going specifically after the most heinous and dangerous criminals, a park ranger who puts in for a lot of transfers and who sometimes just shows up when there's trouble in spite of having questionable credentials, or a Somali pirate on the Horn of Africa whose crew focuses on attacking oil transports. The Ghost Council are shamans and mystics of the dark and unspeakable secrets of the world, scholars of the unreal and esoteric, seekers of forbidden knowledge. They don't seek to understand to heal or to know what is secret, but to delve specifically into mysteries that were not meant to be delved into, making them sort of like a dark academia version of the children of Gaia. They question the wisdom of limiting yourself in arbitrary ways and seek to use all tools on the table in order to fight the worm, recognizing that the rules were not made for them in this fight and thus choosing not to play by them. They they're interested in all sorts of exotic magics and strange spirits that few would dare seek out in the first place, and will get in touch with mages and vampires and fairies and all other sorts of incredibly dangerous beings generally unwilling to part with what they know. Rumor has it that the tribe as a political entity may even include some non-werewolves, be that other shapeshifters or even the occasional gangrel on board with the Gauru cause, though they would never bring them to any meetings of course, so it's probably just a rumor. This sort of interest in forbidden knowledge is exactly why the Ghost Council is distrusted. To the Garu political establishment, tradition is everything and to veer from it is to invite the corruption of the worm. That's why we have tradition in the first place. It's the tried and the true. And honestly, with the extreme lifestyles many Ghost Council Garu lead in their secluded mountain monasteries, their huts deep in the jungle, where umbra and reality blend seamlessly, their hazy opium dens, 
it's hard not to take that worry at least a little bit seriously. Their patron spirit is Horned Serpent, a pragmatic spirit that lurks hidden, unburdened by shame, and privy to the darkest of knowledge. It favors gathering knowledge and using it without regard for how it ought to be used, simply what will have the most effect. At the same time, it bans you from not gathering knowledge, even at the most inopportune and inappropriate times. If you have idle curiosity about something, it reckons, there's probably a reason for it. In the old law, the Ghost Council were actually called Uktena, uh, one of those like Native American ethnic tribes that had to be repurposed somewhat more internationally, though they were known as the Ghost Council as well as Uktena. They had that whole forbidden knowledge thing going on for them, but again, very much tied to like ethnicity. Their patron spirit was even a horned serpent, and Uktena is in fact the Cherokee word for that particular being, which is pretty frequent in American Indian and First Nations cultures. That's obviously also their original aesthetic, just, you know, sort of, sort of dark and, and mysterious. And I really do think for a tribe that does pragmatic mysticism, you could easily manifest the example of the steppe nomad with a dream catcher here, but you don't have to. More than most other tribes, the Ghost Council are now characterized by their diversity of thought. Some classic Ghost Council characters might be an astronomer in Copenhagen who hides the fact that they really can see truth in the stars from their scientist colleagues, a sailor on an iron hauler who dives into the Great Lakes to enter weird pockets of the Umbra, or a cartel Sicario in Sinaloa known for doing really weird Aztec blood sacrifices with their marks. The Glasswalkers are builders and makers, strong political progressives who see no inherent contradiction between the natural and artificial worlds. After all, spirits of the river, tree and snow exist, and so do spirits of concrete, steel, and electricity. Many Garu don't actually know about these spirits or don't care much for them, whereas a few even think of them as aspects of the weaver, if not the worm, that need to be eradicated. Unlike most of the tribes, glasswalkers prefer cities and operate within the structures of civilization, in which they see the same level of spiritual complexity as others see in woodlands. Science and engineering are to them a form of mysticism, and they're excellent at it, working to improve and green cities, to blur the lines between wild and urban, and to use the power of technology to fight the worm and all the other enemies of Gaia. They will do business and amass resources which they can put back into the community to support cultural projects and the underprivileged, making humanity strong in their own fight against the worm. Among the Garu, who are by and large sort of country people, the glasswalkers are often mistrusted, if not outright hated. Back during the days of the Impergium, the human genocide times, if you recall, it was the glass walkers who supported humanity, gave it the tools and knowledge to fight the Garu, even protected it outright, and they were never forgiven for being morally correct about that. Many see them as corrupting agents of the Weaver who have essentially lost the wolves collectively, little more than dogs at this point, and because of geographical separation, this political divide gets bigger every day. Their patron spirit is Spider, a spirit of order, connection, foresight, and patience, which, though a nature spirit, is still metaphysically aligned with the weaver. It's one of the animals that has thrived in urban spaces like few others, and favors the use of scientific and technological means, while at the same time banning the destruction of technological devices and the spirits that reside in them. In the old law, they kept the, the thing where the totem is an animal that's very successful in, like, urban spaces, but instead of it being spider, it was the cockroach, which immediately is a lot worse than spiders, so they kind of did get an image upgrade in, in W5. They had their prehistoric origins in ancient Jewish culture around Palestine, and as a social case had the job of basically playing prison guard to the human population. Their aesthetic was very urbanized and modern, not in like the hobo style bone gnaw manner, but in the slick suit and glass skyscrapers manner. They were quite formally organized for Garu, which they probably still are, in general, they tended to be very integrated into human cultures, and thus the most likely among Garu to view the animist elements of the spirit world through a non-animist lens. Some classic Glasswalker characters might be the director of an environment-focused charity in San Francisco, an anti-government hacker in Moscow, they just 
cannot catch, or a city guide in Rome who communicates with the ancient spirits and ghosts of the city. The Heart Wardens are guardians and tenders of particular places. They dedicate themselves to a sedentary life as protectors of a certain patch of land and often its umbral counterpart, be it a neighborhood or a forest an island, or potentially even a cave. They keep their home bases and sacred places of Garu society, known as Cairns, safe and clean, and usually know every local spirit by name and appellation. They might do this by fostering a community and nurturing the love of humans and animals living in the area, or they might buy a big plot of land and put keep out signs on the fences. And if they don't have the money for that, they might just try to make the place so scary and inhospitable that no one wants to go there. Hospitality is a big deal to them, and they expect you to respect the places they tend just as they will make you comfortable in them. Especially in Cairns, which are inherently magical places, there's certain rules you do not break, and those change from place to place and sometimes time to time. A Heart Warden will always keep you posted on that front, hopefully. If, of course, you absolutely need to go through the heavy door and down the mineshaft because, you know, down the there is a spirit of steam that's keeping the place heated, but also it has information as to the whereabouts of a weaver-aligned piping spirit it used to run with, and it might not be too willing to reveal that information voluntarily, the Heart Warden is going to be a problem for you. This is also the main concern some Garu have with the Heart Wardens. They're very focused on place, on maintaining stability in an eroding world. Notorious homebodies who will only go out to fight if their particular slice of Gaia is threatened, failing to see the bigger picture. Of course, everyone likes a warm meal and a nice place to retreat to, so the Heart Wardens are still a major political force. Their patron spirit is Stag, the king of the forest, guardian of the peace there. He's associated with hunting in some cases, but to the Heart Warden specifically, he's a symbol of stability and mutual existence with the land. He favors that relationship of respect, the give and take of the land helping you if you are kind to the land. And at the same time, bans a failure to protect those whom you have offered the favor of your hospitality. In the old law, the Heart Wardens did not exist as such, but they are clearly an approximation to the old Vienna tribe, which had a, a greater focus on sort of merrymaking and a community spirit, uh, but also an element of hospitality that was pretty big. Not to mention they had the same patron spirit and were strongly associated with fairies. They were one of those tribes uh, colored by a single ethnicity, in their case, the Irish, which one might assume, especially in the United States, would be a very common aesthetic affectation. They still love stories of the old country, but because they don't travel much, I'd assume there's actually not a huge amount of cultural exchange. But then again, you know, there is the internet. Some classic Heart Warden characters might be the trusty innkeep on a remote road in the Scottish Highlands, who always has a story to tell, a farmer in Morocco trying to keep spirits of the desert from invading their region, or the local law of a tiny Inuit community in Nunavut. The Red Talons are radically wild, unapologetic of their beastly side, understanding the natural world is more pure and more real than what humans and human lovers call civilization. They think that though the worm is a problem, the weaver is the real villain. And to protect the nature it is murdering, it and all its servants must be put back in their box if not outright destroyed. They see the deforestation, the coral bleaching, the climate change, the habitat destruction, and refuse inaction and compromise, because that always favors the establishment. Only if the world is returned to a pure state, the weaver slain, can the worm be defeated and the balance returned. Violence and power are the language of this tribe, and everything they do is colored by a primordial bent. To sit around and talk is a tool of evil. Real Garu don't do that. As the tribe with the largest number of wolf-born Garu, they understand themselves to be closest to the natural ideal, and are politically isolated because they feel like the rest of werewolf kind has lost its way. It's not that they don't know any better than to engage in wanton destruction, they just see the truth that terrorizing humanity is the only way to keep its greed in check. Though they can boast about representing some greater ideal and even impress some people that way, among the Garu, the Red Talons are considered loose cannons, or rather fangs, 
who harbor radical and quite frankly genocidal views. To them, the Impergium is not a lesson in the excesses of rage, it's a lost golden age that ought to be ushered in once again. Most Garou frown on the murder of innocent humans, and the Red Talons are disgusted that those Garou would even consider the idea of innocent humans. Even babies harm the planet, they do not deserve to live. Their patron spirit is Griffin, a ferocious spirit of the wild who cares little for the trappings of civilization and thinks of itself as protector of all animals against the predations of humanity and the weaver. It favors the valiant fight, not giving up even when you're broken, and bans the use of science and technology unless you use that science and technology to destroy some aspect of civilization. A computer virus that nukes the entire internet is something even Griffin can get behind. In the old law, they were even more radical and extreme in their hatred for humanity, and actually comprised exclusively of wolf-born Garou, who eschewed most, if not all, technological trappings. They tended to refrain from fighting other Garou, but some tribes, like the Glasswalkers, were essentially seen as no better than the humans they love so much. Their aesthetic is, then, uh, rather naturally natural. There's no cultural affectations because no human human cultures were involved in it, and I think that's a solid way to still play it today. Maybe something a little bit of ye olden timey might do the trick. Maybe something that pragmatically incorporates trash now and then, like how fish use shipwrecks as reef, for instance. But that might get you some side-eye from certain Red Talons. Some classic Red Talon characters might be whatever is responsible for all those national park disappearances David Polites keeps talking about, an isolated rebel in China sabotaging the Communist Party's many hydrological megaprojects, or a surprisingly friendly wolf that a group of young environmental activists encountered while they spiked the chainsaws of a local logging operation in Poland. The Shadow Lords are strategists and schemers, masters of power politics, be it force projection or interpersonal hierarchies. They like to rule, not through pedigree, but through actual real power. And real power, so the Shadow Lords say, can only be achieved by subjugating the weak and using them as tools in the most effective manner. To them, charging blindly into the fray is not just stupid, it's a waste of resources. The Worm and its agents utilize cunning and patience to implement their agendas. The Shadow Lords aim to ruthlessly outplay them, to defeat them utterly, permanently, dominate them, show them that they are not, in fact, the biggest power around. Symbolic victories are irrelevant in the fight against the worm. Shadow Lords will always focus on utilizing the resources of the pack in the optimal manner. To catch the enemy when they're off balance, and to strike without mercy when the time is right. Most Garou will say they want to fight the worm by any means necessary, but what they mean is destruction of property and riling people up against the machine, not amassing wealth and political power, when that should be at the top of that list. Shadow Lords take no pride in being fueled by rage, because what good is a craftsman that is controlled by their tools? If you want to rule through fear, you have to be subtle. You can't be out there trying to prove how scary you are all the time. It comes off as desperate. It's sort of, I mean, it should be obvious why, even though their effectiveness is beyond question, many Garou dislike the Shadow Lords. And it's not just that they're a bit stunted in the empathy department. They are without honor, as Wolf would say. Ends justify the means type people who will seek power over their fellow Garou almost by instinct and expect others to be happy with their subjugation. Shadow Lords love hierarchy. They see even their allies as little more than tools to be used. And it's just not nice being one of those allies when that's the case. Their patron spirit is Thunder. A terrifying presence, whether it rumbles in the distance or is suddenly right there, bursting your eardrums. It's a dark and looming force, just like the Shadow Lords, and favors the manifestation of exactly that kind of intimidating aura. At the same time, it bans having that subtle implication of power dynamics threatened, 
so you better not go around losing fights with your inferiors. In the old lore, they were pretty much exactly the same. All about the power, the schemes, and the politics, and the, like, weird culture of Darwinian meritocracy. They called Thunder Grandfather Thunder, which, quite frankly, like, who, who is to stop you from doing that now, affectionately? They had groups concerned with infiltrating Wormfall and an otherwise rogue tribe, so who knows if they still aren't doing that today. Their aesthetic was often a mix of Central Asian steppe cultural themes with a strong touch of the Eastern European, a little Cossack here, a little Yugoslavian there, but it ultimately always took a backseat to whatever affectations might be the most useful and scary at any given moment, so you should expect nowadays black suits and mirror shades. Some classic Shadow Lord characters might be a local mob kingpin in Lake who is not quite as bad as the others, a Vietnamese arms dealer who supplies certain rebel groups at a significantly reduced rate, or a judge in the Northern Territory of Australia who is at odds with the bar because they are very harsh in their punishment of polluting corporations. The Silent Striders are the ultimate nomads, vagabonds and wanderers on and off the beaten path. They rarely stay in one place for long and have naturally evolved to be the messengers of the Garu world, bringing news, secrets, and important goods from place to place. They have a knack for picking up stuff here that someone over there is going to need. And whenever a Silent Strider arrives, everyone hopes that they have brought that thing for them somehow. They don't always cross continents either. They may well be content learning every facet of the tri-state area, or have a hideout in every major city in a small country in Europe. Naturally, they are excellent diplomats, learning not just various cultural customs, but also a basic sense for picking up on those customs and displaying proper etiquette even when they don't know what exactly is going on. Their travels also don't limit themselves to the physical world. Few know how to delve the depths and long distances of the Umbra like the Silent Striders do. There are paths in there that lead through some weird-ass places, and understanding how to navigate those is a valuable skill indeed. Of course, the attitude of being sort of a nosy tourist who wants to learn all of a place's most intimate secrets, only to then move on and spread those secrets who knows where, it kind of rubs some people the wrong way. They don't really like it. Silent Striders also have a knack for changing things up with the things that they bring. They're not being around to clean up the mess. And then there's also the matter of the curse that a nameless spirit allegedly placed on them. The details of which are not entirely clear and, uh... That's kind of spooky, right? Their patron spirit is Owl, not so much a traveling spirit in and of itself, but certainly one of observation and knowledge, deliberation before rash action. It favors moving to the right place when the time is right, but bans not performing proper burial rites when you witness someone dying. That may sound a little odd, a little bit, uh, you know, out of left field, but it's something Owl does to protect the Silent Striders from the unknown death curse. And the old law actually tells us more about that. The curse was cast by none other than Set, the antediluvian creator of the followers of Set, nowadays known as the Ministry in Vampire the Masquerade, when he drove the Silent Striders from their homeland for opposing him. As a result, Silent Striders tend to have a burning hatred for vampires, whom every one of them would at least know to have been connected to this curse somehow. As you might have logically surmised, the tribe's aesthetic was ancient Egyptian, even as they were travelers in the old lore, to the extent that many would actually adopt sort of Egyptian names. Here, the cross-cultural syncretisms are direct and deliberate, and the tribe probably contributes a lot to the fact that Egypt is the cultural turntable of the Islamic world to this day. Some classic Silent Strider characters might be a zoologist traveling through the Amazon rainforest in search of ancient spirit lore, an Amazigh caravan guide that leads people across the enormous length of the Sahara Desert, or an airline pilot who has a habit of getting lost in some of the places they fly to, and it's becoming a bit of a disciplinary problem. The Silver Fangs are natural-born leaders and rulers, kings 
and barons, people of great social influence who feel a strong obligation to do right by their people, but will also expect their people's loyalty in turn. Among Aru, they are sort of aristocrats who foster new generations of leaders when they see potential in them, and often get to set the ceremonial agenda in any given social gathering. They see this not as a right they are born to, though it certainly is that as well, but focus on the noblesse oblige aspect of wanting to do a good job inspiring those below them, and making the right decisions for their well-being. They're not immune to change and adaptation, and frankly many are not so keen on the hierarchy aspect, and more about the genuine leadership role. But it's hard to extricate themselves from their aristocratic heritage when it's so baked into the culture, up to the point where spirits recognize and honor old pacts you didn't even know about simply because you are a Silver Fang. Or worse, they might actually only discuss deals with a Silver Fang, even if that Silver Fang has no interest in being an authority figure because they feel like only the Garu nobility could possibly have a say in any of this. In times of the post-apocalypse, many Garu do not have that sort of faith in the Silver Fangs, and often resent them for this hard-coded power that is often assumed and unearned. They were the leaders of the Garu Nation, and the Garu Nation failed. It collapsed because it didn't manage to save Gaia, so clearly having the Silver Fang sitting at the top rung of the social pyramid didn't work out so well. This is why especially many younger Silver Fangs try to be worthy of their position, which may lead to them being the sorts of people pleasers that the elders do not recognize as proper Silver Fangs at all. Their patron spirit is Falcon, a spirit of rulers and nobility, elegant and regal, always impressive, never overbearing. Well, maybe sometimes overbearing. Maybe, probably, actually, most of the- actually, it is overbearing all the time, but not in its own mind. It favors leading and inspiring, especially if it's by example. But it's also proud as hell and bans losing face and status in Garu society, which can be a problem sometimes because you do need to grovel a bit now and again to get the right things done. In the old lore, the Silver Fangs were very similar, except because the Garu blood ran along family lines, they were much more tied in with those family lines. They had a uh, noble lineages known as houses, all of which included several blue-blooded families. There is no more blood-related aristocracy, though if you feel like it, uh, you can probably make it so that, specifically with the Silver Fangs, the likelihood of blood relations being Garu is higher, or maybe they have like a ritual to facilitate this. Their aesthetic was well, aristocratic, obviously, with all the frills and all the whistles and the heraldry and everything. It tended to have more of a Russian vibe in many cases, but really you had influences of aristocracy from all over, which is actually very common with aristocrats from various countries because they live in their own rather cosmopolitan parallel society away from the rabble. The Silver Fangs even had incest, so it's the whole package, really. Some classic Silver Fang characters might be a local politician politician in Patagonia who got elected on a platform of helping the poor, and who is somehow actually delivering on that? A distant member of the Japanese royal family who is making headlines because they're calling for widespread systemic reform? Or a vigilante in Johannesburg who is lauded as a hero by the locals? The stargazers are deeply spiritual mystics and clerics, ascetics that have completely removed themselves from Garu politics and have no interest in participating in the war against the worm. As such, they too are one of the non playable tribes in Werewolf 5. They seem to have accepted the reality of Apocalypse and are now working in arcane ways to ensure that the world born after is different. They oppose the Worm Defiler, but often seem actively engaged in a process of seeing the Worm rebirth itself back into a more balanced form. They view problems as systemic and seek to solve them by altering the system, and as such have no use for the crude tactics of the other Garu tribes. Of course, they are internally divided as well, and include sects that have outright heretical, seemingly worm-tainted worldviews. Because of their detached perspective, they seem to be less prone to issues of rage, and some have suggested that they are caught in a sort of collective Hirano much like the Ged of Fenris is caught in Hauglosk. But unlike Garu caught in Hirano, 
they do do stuff. It's just weird stuff. That's exactly why the other tribes distrust them so much. There's no, like, kill on sight policy here. The stargazers are often even part of moots and cans, albeit usually temporarily, and following some sort of clandestine agenda that kinda but not really aligns with the interests of the other Garu. And you never know where exactly that divergence is, because the stargazers are not particularly keen on divulging the secret knowledge they have access to. Their patron spirit is is unknown. No, nobody knows. That's how far this goes. Really, nobody knows who it is, which is honestly kind of suspect. It used to be Chimera, a spirit of enigmas and vague omens and portents, but it's not anymore. And it wasn't like a bad breakup either. Some suspect they have no patron spirit at all now, and this is one of the things they've done away with for the advent of their new world order. Or that maybe the new patron spirit is something dark and evil, or perhaps something altogether alien. I like to think, in my personal hat canon, that it's Sphinx, but it really just is objectively unknown. In the old lore, they were actually not that different in how they operated, except they were playable, and their totem was, in fact, Chimera. They had the role of isolated sages standing outside the political realm, somehow able to manage their beast, and foiling plans of the Garu nation as often as they supported them. They had this sort of Far Eastern guru aesthetic, very Buddhist in outlook, but ultimately surpassing that with its animist streak, and willing to adopt the guise of any clerical framework to translate their understanding of whatever deeper truth they were privy to into different philosophies. Some classic stargazer characters might be a hermit living on top of a Himalayan mountain, where the Sherpas claim the Yeti can often be seen, a city planner in Trenton who is trying to convince people to get rid of the very concept of suburbs, or an outback guide who takes people on intense walkabouts that may or may not involve psychedelic experiences induced by snakebite. As you've seen, Garu deal with a massive magical and spiritual component to their existence. They're both beings of the Umbra, specifically the Middle Umbra, like the dimensions of spirits, and the material world, but they're not fully at home in either. They practice magical rituals that allow them to do some pretty impressive shit, not just related to what you might expect, like healing, being more fierce in combat, purifying areas of pollution, making clothes part of your transformation. They also have rights like being able to enter the spirit world at all, or hiding your home base, or creating a home base in the first place. It's That's a can, a sacred location, usually watched over by a spirit and maintained by a pack or several packs at which point it's called a sept of werewolves. Cans and the rites performed there are core to Garu culture, and they are not just found in pristine nature, but anywhere spirits are strong. So it could be an old castle ruin, overgrown with lush vegetation, it could also be a hookah bar with a long-standing tradition, or it could be a can with an I instead of an E somewhere high up in the mountains. It could even be a well-kept tent city under a turnpike. They're usually built around some sort of note of power, and World of Darkness knowers will maybe ask themselves, hang on, is this a quintessence node or a glamour bale fire? And the answer is yes. That's precisely what this is. So Garu not only compete with each other for control of cans, but also mages and changelings. If you want to learn more about the fair folk in World of Darkness, I have a video on changeling the dreaming. And when it comes to magic, in case you are knowledgeable about about this as well, uh, werewolves don't perform dynamic magic as mages do, but procedural magic like every other supernatural creature. And if you want to know what the difference between those is, I recommend my video on Mage the Ascension. But as those who know know, procedural magic can actually be just as powerful as dynamic magic, and extremely varied. So no matter what you're trying to achieve, some theurge in the whole vast world knows how to do that. But they like to keep that sort of knowledge close to their vests, because magic isn't just something you do lightheartedly. It often involves spirits in some way, who need to be respected, and many rituals don't actually do magic, but are purely social. 
Standing on ceremony is a pretty big deal to the Garu. And while many Garu do not know how to perform any rituals, though they certainly participate in them, most of them do have gifts, which are magical abilities bestowed upon them by spirits. Gifts are potentially even more diverse than rituals, and can be used without knowledge of magic. But they're not free. You usually need to convince a spirit to give you that gift so you'll have to impress them and gain their trust. Some types of gifts may only be given to Garu of certain auspices or tribes. That's the deal that was made in the spirit world. And any spirit who goes against that may find themselves encountering a bit of trouble, so they're not gonna do it. There is a long list of gifts in the core rulebook, and even longer lists of gifts in old rulebooks that you can adapt because there's really no end to them. The same gift can be given by different spirits. So, for instance, if you want dazzling charisma, as in the presence discipline vampires have, you might get it from a peacock spirit, a rose spirit, a butterfly spirit, or a sunrise spirit. Skin that's tough as rock you might get from a turtle spirit, or, you know, a rock spirit. A paralyzing gaze might be gained from a cobra spirit, but also maybe a car headlight spirit. Because everything is spirits. Everything has a spirit. Even the bad stuff. Even the stuff that no longer exists. They go from simple entities with extremely rudimentary intelligence, like the spirit inhabiting a gas lamp, or the spirit of a particular dung pile, or the spirit of that particular gust of wind, to pretty much literal gods like Gaia or Luna or the Triad spirit. They're also fractal entities split into smaller component versions of themselves. Different incarnations and different levels of incarnation. There's the spirit of this rock, and the spirit of this mountain, and the spirit of this mountain range, and the spirit of rock, the spirit of mountain, the spirit of mountain ranges, all the aspects of the same thing, but manifested hierarchically as separate beings. It's basically like how Jesus is the son of God, but also God, pretty much the exact same situation, just massively scaled up. So if you piss off a duck spirit hard enough, duck the spirit with a capital D, the spirit of all ducks, will eventually take note of this, and all the other individual duck spirits will as well. And then the ducks will be pissed at you. Every culture interprets spirits differently and relates to them differently. There are many possible frameworks to see these entities through, and none of them are ultimately correct, because spirits and their hierarchies are inherently beyond mortal understanding. This leads to shamans from various cultures calling upon Fenrir, the Lupa Romana, Raiju, or Malsum. They're all particular aspects of wolf, which manifest differently from each other, but are still faces of the same entity. The spirits also include things that no longer exist, like extinct animals, even long extinct animals like dinosaurs and megalodons. And if you've been paying attention, things that never existed, like unicorns, griffins, and dragons. Mages would understand these entities as bygones, who cannot exist in the material world because they, they'd be unexisted by paradox, since people no longer believe in them. But werewolves don't know any of that, and who knows if the mages are even correct? So to them, they're just spirits. And spirits reside in the Umbra, a sort of parallel, not quite funhouse mirror world that roughly represents the real world through a spiritual lens, and can thus manifest in crazy and evocative ways. For instance, a bazaar would be teeming with spice scent clouds and the constant fluttering and flashing of wild energy of commerce, things changing hands, gold coins raining from the sky, ill-defined people with layered faces, spirits of barter. A coastline contaminated by an oil spill is being consumed by an amorphous black tentacle amoeba that grabs onto seagull spirits and corrupts them into twisted monstrosities. Toxic plumes manifest where the writhing mass touches the land and become poison elementals. An otherwise unassuming suburban house where a grisly murder happened will loom large, its walls stained with seeping blood, not dilapidated, but destroyed with large gashes, horrible wails coming muffled through black windows, giant rooms, cramped corridors that stretch on forever, shadows 
always in the corner of your vision. All places of certain uh, emotional resonances. Everything that happens there colors the umbra and the spirits that inhabit it. Umbral spaces are not concerned with one-to-one -one accuracy, they are representative, so they're pretty much always distorted to better represent the area in a metaphysical sense. They also don't correspond to the geography of the physical world very well, and the deeper you go, the less representative of the physical world the umbra becomes. It's not entirely unlike the dreaming, which is made up of human ideas, but it is different in the sense that it represents reflections of reality, not reflections of imagination sometimes influenced by reality. It's a subtle distinction, but a crucial one. Sometimes those reflections are very old, representing long extinct habitats sometimes inhabited by the aforementioned bygone spirits, some of which are immensely powerful, and even they can manifest in the material world through the power of possession. Now, possession is obviously not unique to bygones, just to make sure that this is clear. Uh, it is the only way that spirits can interact with the real world. World, though. Because, you know, they have no matter. They cannot manifest materially, but they do have a will and a sort of essence. So if they can inhabit matter, they can shape it after their essence and impose their will upon it. Anyone and anything can be a target of possession, but it's not exactly easy for spirits to do. The veil between worlds is thick. Generally speaking, spirits will find it easier to inhabit things that are like them, and harder to inhabit things that aren't. So if you have a duck spirit, it will be easy for it to possess a duck, perhaps other poultry, but very difficult to possess, say, a smartphone, or a tree, or a pile of rocks. It would be relatively easier for it to inhabit an aeroplane, or a duck toy made of plastic, a person that's completely fucking fearless even though they would easily get decked by pretty much everyone they meet. Because all those things share characteristics with duck. They are more like it. Really the only spirits you're going to see possessing stuff in the real world are pretty fucking powerful from the get-go. So they will mutate the things they possess, if only temporarily, to impart traits upon them that are of the spirit. And how that manifests will of course always depend upon the synthesis of spirit and object. A raging ball spirit might manifest in a boxer. So he might grow a thin layer of black fur, or it might manifest in a forklift, in which case the forks might be bent elegantly to resemble horns, or it might manifest in an avalanche, in which case you might recognize a face in it that resembles a charging bull too much to be coincidence. If it were to inhabit a bull, it would resemble the idealized raging bull more closely, up to and potentially including some glowing red eyes. These changes are only produced by powerful spirits, and the targets of possession revert to their original state once possession ends, which doesn't mean that they are somehow no longer, you know, injured, or dead from what happened during possession. Also, if the possession went on for extended periods of time, the mutations might be permanent. But more on that in a moment. Nature and elemental spirits are rarely going to be acting different, trying to possess things they're not supposed to. When it does happen, then you know something is seriously wrong, and there might also even be some other type of fuckery afoot. There's a long list of even weirder spirits, but some of the most crucial in the life of a Garu are the triatic spirits, which serve various aspects of the triad. Wild spirits tend to be very abstract, inconsistent, and fleeting. Their spirits Spirits of change, growth, creation, naturally, whatever the fuck makes the uh, useful mutation half of evolution work. They are rarely seen at all, and when they do manifest something, it's usually like uh, making a dog in the park do something weird that an artist then sees and it inspires her, or a, a wild spirit possesses a couple having the ecstatic sex of their life, and nine months later mommy gives birth to healthy octuplets. When you see a tree that's just unreasonably huge compared to all the others around it, a wild spirit was probably involved. Weaver spirits are most comfortable with inanimate objects, especially technology. They like to inhabit buildings and computer systems, places of order and stability, so courthouses much more than crack dens. The most iconic type of weaver spirit is the pattern spider, so named because they weave the support structure for reality in the umbra, and the stable paths that connect it. They don't always look like spiders, though they tend to look pretty spider-like, 
and they scuttle around, especially the urban areas of the Umbra, to make sure everything stays as it is, repairing damage wherever it occurs. But of course, the most important to the Garu are worm spirits, and they also come in a vast and terrible variety. The most frequently encountered and feared among them are so-called Banes. Spirits of evil and destruction, a whole category of beings all on their own, including gigantic fucking insects crawling around sites contaminated by nuclear energy, grey goo that breaks down and repurposes all things, and whispering mouths that live on 4chan to make people do mass shootings. Banes actively seek to possess things, especially humans, but animals and machines will sometimes do. Like other spirits, they have an easy a time inhabiting things that are like them. So a bane of rage would have to be very powerful to possess a zen monk, but someone with anger issues is easily stoked. They seek out people who were greedy, power hungry, desperate, hateful, and any number of other negative qualities that the worm fosters in society in order to mutate them over time and turn them into fomori that advance the worm's agenda by driving them to ever more extreme acts. Much like no two spirits are identical, no two femori are either. An old lady might resent the loss of her own youthful beauty because she was, quite frankly, a cunt in terms of her personality, so when the good looks stopped being able to draw people in, she became lonely, and eventually became possessed by a bane that made her even more hideous and resentful at all the beauty in the world, which is why she goes around the world seeking beautiful people to disfigure. Initially she did this with blades and acid, but it's been a few years, and she's grown powerful, barely recognizable as a human being anymore, hunched and wrinkled, covered in warts like a hag. All she needs to do is touch someone to turn them into a monstrous looking shell of their former self. Every street she goes down, the colors on the buildings lose some of their sheen and begin to crumble. A businessman might be driven to have it all. He's in love with the analogy of businesses eating each other like bacteria to grow more powerful. A glutton. He indulges in the finest wines, cheeses, meats, and cigars, and one night, he is informed that a homeless man is squatting on one of his properties. Following an impulse he himself does not fully understand, he goes there and destroys the homeless man's shelter, and then he beats the crap out of him. He is a corpulent and powerful guy. The homeless man is scrawny and malnourished, and when he has finally beaten his victim to death, cannot resist but take a bite, which rouses in him a hunger for forbidden flesh. Years have passed here as well, and he's now a big fat mountain of a man who can distend his jaw and consume his business rivals whole. In this, he absorbs their very essence, all their knowledge and personality, and can pretend to be them morphing himself into their shape. But now he is so powerful that he can just vomit them forth to do his bidding, and then slurp them back up again when the deed is done. Sometimes he even does this just for fun, because he knows they're still in there somewhere, in these shell facsimiles of themselves, terrified and in pain. A mad killer wants to murder a whole lot of people with curare poison. So he captured one of the frogs that make it. The frog is a particularly bellicose individual, so the poison is improperly handled by this amateur killer, and he dies. Panicked, outside of its natural environment, the frog finds within itself the instinct to crawl into the warm and wet hole that is the dead killer's open mouth, and pushes itself deep into his head. The Bane, having to improvise a little bit now that its original target is dead, does, and the poison frog melts into the corpse, reanimating it with its small spark of life into a semi-alive state. Now there is a killer afoot in Sao Paulo, with bulging black eyes and strange discolorations of the skin, jumping to impossible places, squeezing through security measures to paralyze people with a touch, not to kill them outright, because the frog killer needs them to be alive when he tortures and dismembers them in the most horrific ways. Oh, and, and did, I, did I actually mention that uh, spirits, including Banes, can possess super supernatural creatures like vampires, 
in mages. Granted, it's not easy for them to do this, given that vampires are naturally resistant to being changed, and mages are pretty much defined by their immense willpower, but that only means that the banes who can possess someone like that are already much more powerful from the get-go. Yeah. For more I and the banes that create them can be horrifying. And Garou spend a significant amount of their time hunting them down to curtail the influence of the worm. What's cool about them is that though there exists a lot of templates you can draw inspiration from, they are ultimately idiosyncratic monsters, which I absolutely love. Because instead of just being cannon fodder, they come with a unique an interesting story every time. And yes, though Werewolf the Apocalypse is certainly a game about fighting and killing bad shit, it's more foundationally, like all World of Darkness, a game about telling those kinds of stories. It's about politics and our relationship with meaningful change. It's about the issues that arise with your old life when you suddenly find you are a fucking werewolf. Even more so than it is with Vampire, where you usually are completely cut off from the people in your old life. And I think the variety of ways you can manifest the themes of that kind of story through spirits and the Umbra has enormous potential. So quite frankly, I hope this video has made you as inspired to try out Werewolf as I was making it. Whatever edition you may prefer. There's a huge amount of Werewolf deep lore out there. None of it's technically official anymore, I suppose. But it does exist, and, you know, there's nothing stopping you from implementing it to your liking. So go out there and go nuts! Thank you very much for watching this video. Like, comment, subscribe, and share it to your relevant communities. Consider supporting me on Patreon, buying some of my merchandise, or my short story collection. You can find both of them here. Merchandise even has new items. Uh, by the way, a reason I no longer say, but do not spam them to like the regular communities bit is that I had a conversation with someone and they were like, oh, I, I didn't, uh, I wanted to post it somewhere, but then I didn't do it because I was afraid someone else would do it at the same time, no matter how unlikely that was. And then we'd be spamming. So I didn't do it. And that's kind of not the point if, that I'm trying to make. Also, I don't know why you expected this video to be an April Fool's joke. I am known to be someone who says that only a fool does an April Fool's joke on April Fool's. And in that spirit, see you around, cunts.